conference. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Luca Pelitti from the Santa Marinella Research Institute, which is a very nice logo next to the ICTP logo. <laughs> Hi, so I really thank you for being invited to this very exciting conference. And I was a little bit afraid that, that was, uh, uh, my contribution would be a little bit out of the scope. But uh, if you remember Suri, uh, Suri contribution in the first days, I think that it is more or less in the same line. So I, let's put it, I'm a bit less ashamed in doing that. Um, now, if I remember. So the first thing, so I have to mention that this work has been done in uh, collaboration with Armita Nur Mohammed and Oskar Schnack. It started just before the COVID, so it went on over a, a long time essentially by uh, intercontinental Zoom. And so there were some problems in communication, but I think that now it has uh, taken, uh, taken shape. And what, is, what we are trying to, to do, say, say that uh, bi biological systems need to store information about what they found in the environment. And uh, one of the uh, tasks they have is to recognize uh, stimuli that have been presented to them in the past. And, but these stimuli sometimes do change with time, and so we have a problem that usually with, when you have a most learning algorithm, you usually try to, uh, try to recognize the stimuli that are unchanging in time. So the, like the uh, retrieval, uh, retrieval algorithms that uh, Suri uh, had shown, in, but in other cases, you have uh, these stimuli just a change in time in an unpredictable way, and you still want to identify, uh, to identify the stimuli. I uh, stress that I'm not talking about a retrieval. So it, it's not like the point of, of reconstructing, uh, reconstructing an image out of a partial information on the image, but more like the kind of things that we do when we recognize faces. Faces change with time, but nevertheless, we are still able to attach, well, at least usually, we are still able to attach a name to a face, or, or, but even if we don't attach a name to the face, we are still attach an identity to this face, and this is, say, the minimal performance that we try to that we try to reproduce with our system. So now the problem is that when the, when the stimuli change with time, you have to keep track of that. And of course, this imposes a load on your system. And this requires also that you match your learning rates, your update rates, with the rate of change of the stimuli. And uh, you are you have a problem that sometimes in this way you, you will have mismatches or, or you are un unable to recognize a stimulus that in fact was uh, some time before in your repertoire. And the problem is that how you, can you reconcile efficiency and with the risk of, uh, of making mistakes? And this is the kind of problem that we are trying to to discuss in a very abstract way, in fact. Uh, what we do, so uh, Suri has made an excellent introduction to the Hopfield-like systems, and so I'm not going to repeat the basics, but say that if you abstract uh, what, you, what was from, uh, was they said by Suri, the idea is that you have a repertoire, you can consider it as an ensemble, if you like, but a repertoire is, is the response of the system to arbitrary patterns that are shown to the system. And this repertoire is, uh, so we assume that the, the uh, stimuli are encoded in a binary pattern. So we have a binary pattern with, uh, with L units. Uh, each, un each pattern is a, a binary pattern, plus or minus one, and the repertoire associates some weights uh, to uh, any pattern that, that, has, uh, that, uh, that has been encountered in, in, uh, in the past time, that is, say, of relevance to the system. So here we have, uh, so this, these weights are uh, 
kind of, of uh, probability, if you like, but probability-like quantities. And alpha goes on uh, from one to n, so n is the number of patterns that we want to keep track of within our system. And we have to update the repertoire each time we are shown with a pattern and the pattern has been recognized in order to keep track for the changes of the pattern itself. And the way, say, we look at it is by a Hebian learning rule. So the idea is that you have, you have to update these weights. You are shown, say, with, pattern, uh, with a given pattern, and then you, uh, for given pattern, uh, say, beta, and so you, if you, if you are shown with a pattern beta, you recognize it, then you have some sort of metadynamics that tells you that your repertoire must be updated according to this rule for all patterns that are different from beta, you decrease slightly this weight. And the, uh, in this way, you, you free a certain amount of, uh, say, of, uh, pattern space, and uh, you increase by lambda, this is a learning rate, the weight corresponding to the pattern that you have, shown be, you have been shown and that you have recognized. And of course, that means that in, in general, you have that for a pattern that has not been shown for a certain amount of time tau, the, uh, uh, the weight will go down in time. So you forget patterns that are uh, shown more rarely. How do we measure the performance of such a system? Well, we define the affinity of the repertoire to the pattern, and this affinity is, so now the, the pattern chi is supposed to be, we consider just an arbitrary pattern, so just a, a binary vector of length L. And we say that the affinity of the repertoire to the pattern is given by, is proportional, say, the sum over all the stored pattern of the overlap between the stored pattern and the, uh, the pattern chi that you're shown with to some power theta. And just for generality, we, int we introduce this exponent theta. But uh, to take the simplest case, and in fact, the only one that we are really uh, we really simulate is the one in which theta is equal to two, and th in this case, uh, this is, becomes just an ordinary Hopfield model. Uh, the overlap is defined in this way, is the, uh, so it is, is the sum, is the, uh, say, uh, uh, the uh, scalar product of the pattern psi and the, and the pattern chi uh, normalized by L, just to give it a, a unit. And the idea is that we decided that the pattern is recognized by its affinity if its affinity is sufficiently, uh, is sufficiently different from the, um, from the affinity with the random pattern. So again, uh, this is a sort of metadynamics. So we say that you would just look at the, the distribution of affinities for random pattern, and then we say that a, a pattern is in the repertoire, it has been, and then, therefore it has been recognized, and it is susceptible to be, uh, to update the, uh, the repertoire if, this, if its uh, affinity is um, larger than this uh, random affinity. Now, the dynamics of the pattern is, is a sort of mimicked on the very simple idea of random walk in this uh, in space of, uh, space of uh, binary vectors. So they evolve at the spin flips, at the rate of spin flips, a mu per spin per generation. And we consider that the patterns belong, so at the beginning we have L, we have N different patterns. And uh, with, this, with a number n, which is much uh, smaller than the length of the patterns themselves, in such a way, for instance, that for a, for a usual Hopfield model, we are well below the uh, capacity of the Hopfield uh, network to perform a retrieval. But in this case, we are 
even less uh, uh, we're, uh, we require even less the only thing that say the only thing that we want to know is whether the uh, the affinity is large enough in order to say that we recognize it and that, that's it I mean that's the only thing we want to know now what we expect is that we have for each ancestor we define a class so the class is the actual evolution of the patterns with that ancestor over time. So there is only one, say, line which changes in time and is defined by this uh, function. Say, this is a, the pattern with ancestor C at time T. And so we have N classes that are defined by these trajectories in, uh, in spin space. And we expect that uh, the overlap between uh, um, a pattern at time t belonging to some class and it's uh, uh, the same and the uh, pattern, let's say, belonging to the class of c prime and time t plus tau. Now, if, these, uh, if they belong to different classes, that's, this will be just given by fluctuations of the order one over square root of L. And if they are on the same class, it will uh, be given by rho to the time tau, where rho is, uh, the, uh, um, uh, encodes the effects of mutations. So uh, it's given by this expression here. It's, a, it's a one minus two mu, and so we have an exponential decay over the overlap between, the, say, the ancestor, the old guy, and uh, the new guy. Now we, uh, we arrive at the problem. The problem is that how can we decide, uh, design a system that in some sense is able to recognize um, patterns belonging to the different classes um, in uh, reliable and uh, say, uh, and efficiently. So what we want to have is that you have the signal is encoded in the, is encoded in the affinity for, for recognized patterns. Uh, but the, of course, let's say you can, you can have a very high affinity, but you can have a large probability of, uh, of making mistakes. So in you, what we want to have is to balance in some way this, uh, um, the, this affinity with the, the risk. And the risk is encoded in the, in the spread of the affinity over the patterns. Uh, we, liked, we decided to use uh, the uh, standard deviation of the affinity over the encoded patterns as, an, um, as a measure of risk. Of course, uh, this uh, uh, standard deviation tells you what is... Yes, there is a question. Sorry, uh, can you go back to the previous slide, please? Yes. Yeah, um, so you see that um, point number three, the spin flip at a rate of mu, that's a mutation rate. Right. Um, and uh, if there is a constant mutation rate, how would you store anything over a period of time? Um, over a period of time, after, after tau steps, uh, the tendency is to forget. Yeah, so, but in fact, uh, you store, say, the, uh, effectively store just the last uh, part of the of the trajectory in some average way, so this is what is encoded. In uh, you, you see that the the overlaps decrease, and then every time you are shown uh, a pattern and you recognize the pattern, that is that the affinity of the shown pattern with respect to the uh, with the with the reservoir is large enough, then you perform an update. And that means that you have a contribution to the repertoire which is close to the pattern that you have been shown, and you forget a part of the rest. Okay. So what you have is a sort of, a, not really a snapshot, but an integrated snapshot of the last uh, times that you have been shown the same pattern. So it's continuous remembering. It continuously remembers it okay. and forgets the old ones. Okay, thank you. I know that this doesn't really work with human memory for faces. Sometimes we remember people 
just how they looked like uh, 30 years ago. Huh? <laughs> yeah, but e exactly. Say so the problem of the smell is uh, it, it, probably the smell works in a different way than this thing. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that is probably, uh, all right. Okay, so this is, so the idea is that you define an objective function that depends on, uh, on a parameter kappa, which is uh, uh, measures the risk, um, how to say, risk tolerance. No? So uh, when kappa is small, then you, you are, uh, you would, so the uh, in changing in changing kappa you you change the weight of the uh, of the standard deviation of the weights uh, as in, in with respect to the performance and then you can evaluate what is the optimal learning rate so we have the, we have these two parameters the learning rate that is the amount of updating that you do every time you recognize a pattern and uh, as a function of, of the, uh, this uh, risk uh, tolerance K, a kappa and the mutation rate, and you get uh, that it behaves, more, it behaves in this way plus uh, some corrections. Uh, and this is quite, uh, quite uh, reasonable to, to understand. So first of all, it goes down with the number of, of patterns that you have to remember. So, uh, because if you want to, if you want to keep up, to keep up with the uh, a great number of patterns, then you better not uh, erase uh, whatever is uh, you got uh, before too fast. And then it goes up with this uh, kappa. If you want to be, uh, say, a bit less risk tolerant, it goes up, of course, when the mutation rate increases. Here I defined this a mu effective mutation rate, which is simply the um, say the bare mutation rate times the number of patterns, because say the idea is that you more or less you encounter your uh, your pattern every every n steps. So that's it. Lambda is the learning rate, so you have this update rule. The update rule you add. The, uh, you add the pattern that you have been shown to the reservoir, uh, to the repertoire with a, a factor lambda, and then you depress all the other by the rest in such a way that the normalization is conserved. Essentially, that you need that the mu and n are. This is a first order in mu and n, basically, a mu effective and n. And so, it's a, you you ask that this is a quantity, or it's a comparatively small quantity. How do you set the um, the normalize the regularization factor kappa? Oh, okay. This is a this is. I, I will discuss that. Okay. I will discuss that. Okay, so here, uh, so, uh, so in fact, uh, what we are discussing is a sort of risk return trade off. So for, and uh, this is what we have. Um, uh, what is uh, uh, th this plot shows this objective function, which depends on, uh, depends on kappa and on the parameter of the dynamical uh, process that is going on as a function of the learning rate. And we have some uh, analytic result and the simulation say, shows that we understand more or less what happens because it agrees with the simulation. Here we, we have chosen a value of kappa which is equal to one and all the simulations are done with theta equal two which is the uh, Hopfield, uh, Hopfield case because this is the simpler case to, to simulate basically, that's all. Now, uh, here we have uh, the optimal learning rate, and so we have this uh, expression that I showed you that the optimal learning rate is a function of different parameters, and, um, 
uh, these are the results of, say, more or less the results of the simulations for different values, different values of the parameters, number of patterns, uh, the uh, kappa and uh, this uh, theta. Uh, so here the theta, except in these two cases, again, it's, of, uh, it's usually two. And the, um, the length of the the length of the patterns is 200, so we are well below the uh, capacity. And you find all these lines as a function of optimal rendering rate, as a function of the mutation rate. And uh, they, uh, all these lines, KSA, can be uh, collapsed by using the expression of the, learn of the optimal learning rate I showed you before in one line that is shown in the inset. So it seems that it works more or less. And again, here we have the optimal learning rate as a function of the risk tolerance kappa. And again, we have uh, different cases. And the collapse is much less. Well, this is, this is again the theory and the, the, the curve collapse, but a little bit away from, from the, say, the, the theory which would tell, you, tell us that it goes like kappa to the power two thirds. So it's, well, there is some definition that we don't quite. Now, about the choice of kappa. The re this, is a, uh, this is a problem of uh, constrained optimization. And kappa tells you how much you, how much you trade uh, risk for efficiency. So in fact, what we have is a Pareto front. So a Pareto front we, in, that, we can, uh, uh, that we can show by looking at how, what is the optimal, say, the, the value of the risk, so the, uh, uh, the normalized standard deviation with respect to the average value of the affinity as a function of the mean affinity of the, say, of the performance. And as you change kappa, then you move along this line then this is the accessible region. Of course, you can always have high, larger risk than uh, the optimal risk. And so the, you move along this accessible uh, region. Uh, there are, and these are the Pareto curves for different values of the effective mutation rate. And, uh, and you move along this region by going by changing the value of K, so by increasing the value of K. Uh, there is only one thing is that you have to say in, in this value here and here is in fact the average value of the affinity once you have uh, removed the uh, average, the affinity for random patterns, uh, af ran average affinity for random patterns. Now, we have to evaluate the performance. The performance, of course, is not just the value of the affinity, but the actual uh, probability that you discriminate between patterns that you have encountered in a different way in the past and the ones that you are shown uh, before. So the, uh, what you have to do is to set up uh, a threshold and say, well, if the affinity is larger than the threshold that we decide that the pattern has been recognized, and otherwise, it's uh, considered to be random. And of course, what you have here, we, we have a, an extra parameter that is just on the metadynamics. It's not on the, say, it's not on the definition of the reservoir. It's on the metadynamics where, where you have deci to decide if the pattern is recognized or not. And so uh, here you have. Uh, you have a distribution probability p psi is the the uh, is a probability distribution of the affinity for the patterns that belong to the reservoir, and then you have the distribution of probability of affinity for the random patterns. And what you have is that uh, this red line, say in, schematically, this is uh, the distribution of uh, for the random patterns. This is the distribution for the patterns that are in the reservoir. And here, so this area here is uh, the, uh, the probability of having false positive, And this air, white area on this side is the probability of having false negatives. So what you do is that in, in changing theta, you say you can change the, uh, you, can, you can evaluate how these probabilities uh, evolve. 
And this gives you what is called the receiver operating characteristic curve. That is a plot that, say, gives you the performance of a binary classifier. It's simply, uh, say, uh, parametrically, a parametrical curve that gives you the true positive rate as a function of the false positive rate as, it, uh, as you change the threshold theta. And of course, if you have a random classifier, you have just a diagonal, and then you expect, you hope that this, uh, your curve is, lies above the random classifier. And so the idea is that uh, try the uh, overall performance is obtained by getting the curve that is below this uh, RLC curve. So just, this is a measure of the actual discrimination power, discriminating power of our system. Uh, so it is, this is quantity that looks like uh, a beast in the, in the Alps, but in fact, it's just the area under this curve. <clears throat> okay, so we have to evaluate these probability distributions. What is the probability distribution for random patterns and the probability distribution for memorized patterns? And they turn out to belong to some, say, sort, well, to be close to gamma distributions with, uh, say, for random patterns, you have this uh, mean that is goes with L, the length of the pattern to some power, some variance, and then, and then you have, uh, of course, a lambda dependent and mu dependent um, distribution for the uh, patterns that you have recognized. And again, they look say pretty much like some sort of gamma distribution. So we end up by say simply say evaluating mean and variance of this distribution and then taking a gamma distribution to evaluate the uh, uh, ROC. Uh, so this is just to come fact that uh, using this analytic form of the, of the distribution is not too far off. And we all evaluated, of course, the uh, kullback libel divergence and um, trying to find some reason to find, to evaluate the errors that we make. But, okay, so what we plot here is the, uh, this area under the ROC form, so say the performance curve, discriminating power per, uh, as a function of the risk tolerance and the effective mutation rate. And you find that it, the phase space is nicely separated in, in some region. So the, you, um, if you, in, uh, say, increase the risk tolerance, you find that you end up that your, your system, in fact, can only memorize one class. Uh, one class because say the, the essentially one class is uh, occupies the whole phase space because of this spread is very large uh, if you uh, instead you want to be very strict you end up that you you are too strict that you have, you don't find um, say there is no way of uh, of um, of uh, putting uh, uh, having memory at all, and then there is uh, some intermediate region in, in which, say, uh, this is, say, again, the point is that here, uh, of course, uh, the performance degrades if you increase the mutation rate, so this is why these uh, lines go, uh, say, in this way, and you have this region of good memory in between, so with intermediate risk tolerance, and provided that the mutation rate is not too, too high. Um, this was obtained by using these asymptotic forms on the, uh, on the probability distributions, and we compared it with the, with the simulations. In fact, we had the problems. It's essentially, in this area here, we were not able to distinguish between a completely random, a completely random um, repertoire and the repertoire which followed our rules. So. We, uh, say the uh, data were completely unreliable, but that this other boundary was pretty well reproduced and the performance was, uh, say, uh, okay. 
And basically, this is just the uh, evaluating the optimal learning rate in the different regions. So what you find is that, say, here, the optimal learning rate is simply too, too low. So it, it's just uh, going random. Uh, say that there is no performance at all. Here you have an optimal learning rate that is very high. That means that every time you are shown a pattern, then you forget all the rest. And of course, that means that you can, you can only have one, one pattern in the side. And in the good memory, so you have some sort of intermediate learning rate in this region. So you are able to store, uh, you are able to store a certain amount of pattern that is comparable to what you would store in a usual uh, Hopfield model, so it's about, say, 10% of the, of the length. And that's about it. So we have that if you have a risk tolerant reservoirs, they say if you, if you are tolerating risk, you follow, you follow well the recent patterns and then you forget the older ones. And if you don't want to, to make mistakes, then you are usually, you are very, you are very conservative, but that means that you have, do not have space to, to, come, to keep track of many patterns at the same time. So a moderate risk tolerance allows to get the best of both worlds. And of course, the balancing depends really pretty much on the state. And if you increase, if the um, evolution rate of the patterns increases, then the range of uh, tolerance narrows because you see that the lines. Tend and so there is a, a region in which a performance and risk are valued at the same time. And so the, one, of, one of the problems is that can we identify something like a working regime for the immune system and immune memory in this way? Is, the, is this relevant for the immune memory in some sense? Uh, I, and, so it, and the other thing is that what you do with the artificial, artificial network, you can, can you incorporate this idea in evolving uh, networks? Um, thanks. Uh, this is.